If, if this is your first time or maybe you haven't been here before, my name is Pastor Adam. I am the senior pastor here at Connect Church. And, you know, the thing that uh, I get to do today um, is I get to bring you the Word of God. Come on. The Word of God is what changes our life. The Word of God is what takes us from where we are to where God wants us to be. And a lot of times that journey is not fun. A lot of times that journey is hard. You see, when a lot of people think that when you become a Christian, like it just, everything just planes out, everything's just easy, everything, no, uh uh. Guys, listen, we, there, there are tests, there are trials that we go through as Christians. The Bible says, in order to purify our faith, just like gold is purified in the heat, a lot of times we've got to go through some things to purify our faith, to purify who we are. And that's a message a lot of people don't like hearing. Come on. Because that means hardships sometimes. That means times that when we've, you know, I, I've seen before, it, it's funny, we've got a, a gentleman here that started tithing, and Roger talked about tithing. Uh, he started tithing, and as soon as he made up his mind, I'm going to start tithing, you know what happened? Somebody stole money out of his account. But as soon as that happened, he said, no, you know what, I'm not going to let the devil steal that. And he continued to tithe off of even what he had in there, even though he didn't have somebody that stole his tithe out of his account. And God continued to bless that. We had another lady that started tithing here, a single mom of two that started tithing. Within five months, five months, she was completely debt free. She had never been in that place before. It blew her mind what God had done, the way that God had done things. And I'm not saying we give to get. That's not it. I'm just saying that when our heart is pure, come on, when we give without a motive but just because God asked us to, there are blessings that flow after that. And I want you guys blessed, not just financially, but spiritually, emotionally, physically. Come on, y'all. God's got blessings for us. Amen? That was all free. It wasn't part of the message. Y'all just take that one, whatever you want to do with it. Amen? So as Roger had mentioned earlier, uh, those books are out there. We bought uh, a, kind of not a, really a surplus, but we, we bought a, a number of those books so that we could get them at a cheaper price so that you guys wouldn't have to pay the 20 or 25 bucks that they cost. They cost us 15 in bulk price, so that's what you guys are getting them for. There's also some donkey mission books left out there. Uh, individually, you can buy those for $5 a piece. Um, that's what we paid for them. Uh, just a blessing. If you got somebody that goes through things, you guys need to give them that book. Like that book will bless them and teach them about uh, the donkey missions in our life. And if, if some of y'all are like, what is a donkey mission? We just did a series, go watch it. So. <laughs> so before we get going, I just want to pray. Because here's the thing. God's not going to come into a place that he's not revered in, that he's not reverenced in. Like if all of our focus is not on him, why in the world? If you're trying to hold a conversation with me one-on-one -on -one, and I'm over here talking here, how long are you going to try to hold that conversation? You're going you're gonna to turn away and you're going to be like, well, he's got something else going. So how many times do we try to hold a conversation here and we let other things bother us? We let other things that draw us away. How many of y'all, when you start praying, the grocery list seems to come up? Come on, y'all. Like, oh, I forgot about that. I got to put the milk on the list. You know what I mean? I took a drink of it last night and it was bad. You know what I mean? Come on. Like, it seems like every time you start praying, it things tend to take you in another direction. So what we want to do is we want to bring ourselves back in. I want you to have an expectation of God this morning. Because it doesn't matter what's preached from this platform. If you have an expectation to hear from God, you'll hear it. Guys, we could sing, Old McDonald had a farm up here, and if you had an expectation to get something from God, he would show you something. Don't limit God this morning. Don't limit God in your life. Take God out of the box that we put him in every Sunday morning. When I go to church, I check a box, and that's all I do. Like I went to church, that's done. I get to go have lunch, that's done. I get my Sunday afternoon nap, that's done. We can't watch the Cowboys lose, so that's okay. I'm just kidding. I'm not a Cowboys fan, as you can see. But a lot of times we put in, we just check boxes. Let's don't check a box this morning. Let's put a focus in on God and ask him to, to do something in our heart this morning. 
So you guys pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you. And Father, I honor you this morning from this platform. Father, I thank you this morning for who you are. You are the creator of the universe. You are the king of kings. You are the one that looked down and said, I want a people that will worship with me that I can fellowship with. And Father, we just, we want to worship you, God, because of what you've done in our lives. God, you're truly an amazing God. Father, open our hearts up today that we may receive from you. Open our ears up today, Father, that we can hear from you, Holy Spirit. And open our eyes up this morning that we may see what you have for us in the word of God. Lord, I thank you for sending your word to us to help guide us through this life until we ultimately reach heaven with you. Lord, you're amazing. And Father, we give you the honor and the glory and the praise this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So we're on a series called Awe of God. And today I want to talk about revealed as we are. So that, that, that verse or that, that uh, uh, title actually comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 9 we start and it says this. It says, for we must all appear and be revere, revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ. Those three revealed as we are. You see, there's three images that we have of us. Every person is this. The first one, you ready? Take some notes if, you, if you're writing them down. If you're not, take notes. If you don't have them, get your phone out, get your, get your notepad out. Come on, get your Bibles out, get your glow, your glow Bibles out. Let's, let's, let's dig into the Word of God this morning. So every, every human being has three images. Number one, you ready? We have our perceived image. Our perceived image is how others see us. So I was, I was reading and I was studying through this, and, and when I got to that one, it was like, what is our perceived image? Like, how, how does that really explain? And, and I go back, so my wife, uh, how many of you ladies and guys, I know y'all aren't going to raise your hand, it's okay, um, watch Hallmark. Yeah. See, only the ladies. Um, I know you guys. Don't act like y'all don't watch it. Um, but, you know, in Hallmark, there was this one show that my wife was watching. I sat down and watched it. And, and what, what the whole deal was was this, this, uh, this guy took this girlfriend home to meet his family. She comes in, is meeting the family, but she won't eat any of the food that they've cooked. And so they start looking at her like, okay, so like you're stuck up, like you don't like the food that we like, you don't eat the things that we eat. And so they go, and throughout half of the show, all you think, no, I, I'm, I'm okay, I, I brought this, or, or I made this to eat, and, and, and she's always like trying to stay away from the things that they cooked, and so it's really making the family mad. And so the perception of her was, she's stuck up, she doesn't like our food, she's too good to eat our food. Well, about halfway through the show, it kind of reveals that she actually has, um, she's allergic to like gluten and different things like that. So had she have eaten what they were, had cooked, she would have become deathly ill and even died. So you see, we all have this perceived image. We all have this image that others looking at us are going, they're like this. They're doing that because of this. Because that's how they perceive who we are. So number two, we have our projected image. Our projected image is the way we desire others to see us. This is a big one, guys, because we desire people to see us a certain way. When you go and you take pictures for Facebook, how many does it take to get that right picture? Like how many times do you have to tell the kids to stop, be still, quit acting up, let's take the right picture, I just need one good one, that's all I need, one good picture so I can post it, and you finally get that one picture, you're like, all right, why, because that's how I want to be perceived, I want to be perceived as my family is all together, my family and all together, just so y'all know, 
but I, I, I want to be perceived that way on Facebook and Instagram. I feel like if, that if, if, if I don't let others think that I look this way, that they'll judge me this way. So we all have a perceived image. We have a projected image. And then we have this final one, which is our actual image. Our actual image uh, is who we really are. This can be hidden or unnoticed by others, but it is fully visible to God. Fully visible to God is our actual image. Not the way people see us, not the way we want people to see us, but who we actually are. Our character of who we actually are comes out in that. You know, let's consider Jesus in this. Because if we consider Jesus and his perceived image, it was very unfavorable. You know, Jesus was misunderstood. Jesus was lied about. He was said that he was demon-possessed. He was a drunkard, a glutton, an unholy man who hung out with sinners, a heretic, and the list just goes on and on. That was his perceived image. That's the way people looked at him. But you know that perceived image is not the one that uh, actually stayed. In, in John chapter 7, this is very interesting. Um, if you'll go over there with me, John chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 3. And it says this, and it says, Jesus' brothers said to him, okay, listen, he said, uh, leave here and go to Judea, where your followers, look at this, can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. And verse 5 says, for even his brothers <laughs> didn't believe in him. You see, Jesus' brothers were controlled by the image they wanted to perceive from others. They were controlled by, the, well, they, said, they said, listen, hey, let's go over here where you can be seen. Like, we want to do this in public. We want to make this thing happen. And Jesus is looking at him like, you crazy. Like, that's what you want. You want it to be perceived. You want it to be projected a certain way. Jesus' actual image is quite different than many perceived. Here's his actual image. Colossians 1.15 says this. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. See, a lot of people in his time didn't believe that he was God. But scripture tells us that he is the visible image of an invisible God. In Matthew chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 16, it says this. It says, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit descending on him like a dove and settling on him. And the voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. God Almighty audibly confirmed this is my son and who I love. Wasn't the image that everybody perceived him to be. But that was his actual image. The son of God who came from heaven, who is God that we can actually see the visible character of an invisible God. Listen, Jesus' perceived image is not what endured, rather his actual. It wasn't what everybody perceived, but what lasted was his actual image. Can I tell you that your perceived image and your projected image is not what's going to last? That it's going to be the actual image that God sees. It's going to be the image that's inside that God sees you when you're doing. Not what people think about you. Not the way you want people to think about you but your actual image is what's going to last through eternity. Look at this. While Jesus was on the earth, here's what happened. He shunned self-promotion in any effort to build his own reputation. He avoided popularity, notoriety, 
or any accolades and approval of men. He didn't want it. When people wanted to promote him to be king, he pulled away. There was no facade, false uh, illusions, or deceit in him. He delighted in the fear of the Lord, which kept his focus on the Father. Listen, when our perceived image carries greater weight, listen to me, when our perceived image carries greater weight than our actual image, here's what happens. Our reputation is what we protect. We care more about what people think about us than what God does. Our efforts will focus on appearance, status, titles, popularity, acceptance, reputation, and so on. For they cover our shortcomings. We want people to perceive us a certain way. We want to project a certain image because we don't have that holy fear of God. But none of this is what will be revealed. Listen to me. None of this is what will be revealed and examined at judgment. Rather, it will be our actual image which centers around our, you ready? Our motives and our intentions. If we lose the holy fear of God and we're more worried about our projected and our perceived image, when you get to heaven, you're going to be surprised. Because God's going to say, I don't care about that. I care about who you actually were. I care about your actual motives and the intentions behind who you are. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says this. It's starting in verse 5. It says, I love this. It says, so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. For he will bring our darkest secrets to light. And will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due you know many discount this scripture because uh, they apply it to unbelievers the scripture doesn't apply to unbelievers and here's why because there's no unbeliever that's going to receive praise and judgment this scripture is talking about Christians and our darkest secrets and our deepest motives are going to be shown forth on judgment day and if we don't have the holy fear of God here, then we're going to be in trouble there. Listen, our awareness of the judgment's reality creates a holy fear, which in turn keeps us in check and enables us to live from our actual image. Guys, we need to quit this projected image. We need to quit and forget about how people, I forgot that a long time ago. I don't care how you perceive me. There's only one person that I care about who knows who I actually am, and it's God. And that's the only person I care about. That's the only person that I want to see the actual. You can perceive me how you want. And I, I try to project Jesus through my life. Not always. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We're all flawed. But it's this holy fear that keeps us. So if that's true, then the opposite of that's true. The more we lack the fear of the Lord, the more we will lean on our projected image. If we don't take into this fear, this holy fear, then our projected image is what we're going to care about. And that's what we're going to lean on. So there's a couple in, in, in the New Testament called Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias and Sapphira, so a little bit of backstory because they come into to play in Acts chapter 5. The very beginning of Acts chapter 5 is where they start telling their story. But just prior to that actually gives us a little backstory uh, to them because prior to that, uh, Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 36 and 37, the last verses of that, it says this. It says, uh, Barnabas, a Levite 
of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So you have this man from Cyprus. Now, Cyprus was very wealthy. They had stones. They had abundance of, of precious stones, copper, uh, iron mines, great sources of lumber at this time, uh, uh, famous for, for all different kinds of things. And so you've got this man from, from, from Cyprus that comes into the church. And he goes, you know what, man? I'm going to sell some land, and I'm going to give it to the church. Like, I want to bless people. I want to help people. You see, I find it funny. Huh, I, yeah, I'll go there. So I find it funny how, how, how we look at 10%, the tithe that God asks us to give, and like, man, I can't give that. If we want to be a New Testament church, let's just sell everything we got and give it. Okay. Anyway, um, sorry, that was just a side note. Um, so, so as we end in chapter 4 with, with Barnabas, right, selling this land and bringing it, it doesn't say how much it was. He kind of sparked something in Ananias and Sapphira, this other couple. And so here's what it says in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. Now notice that it says, but. Meaning that you got to go back to what had just happened. Because here you have somebody coming in from the outside from Cyprus, selling some land and giving it, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, like we're the top givers in the church. Like, we're going to sell some land and give it to the church. Kind of sparked some things in them. So they immediately went and sold some land. But verse 2, let's look at this. It says, he, which is Ananias, brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. So you have a husband and wife who saw somebody sell some land, give it to the church, and they're like, oh, we're not going to be outdone. We're going to go sell some. And then they projected an image that they gave it all because they wanted to be perceived as doing that. But here's what happened to them. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 says this. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, it was, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this, in your, this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last breath. So from verse 6 to verse 10, it says that his wife came in, not knowing that he had just passed away. And his wife came in and they asked her, so is this all of the money that you guys got from the, from the sale of the land? He said, yes, it was. She fell out dead. And it says this, in verse 11, it says, So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. So you have to realize what Peter said. He said, listen, he said, man, the land was yours. You could sell it or not sell it. And once you sold it, that was yours too. You could give it or not give it. But what you came in and did was you perceived and projected that you gave it all because you wanted everybody to think you gave it all. And you wanted to be perceived as big givers. And you lied to the Holy Spirit by doing that. So what initiated this response? Could it have been that the couple uh, up to this point, maybe their reputation was to they're the biggest givers? And here this outside guy came in and gave some. Maybe this couple enjoyed their respect and the attention of being the biggest givers. Maybe their insecurities were threatened of being outdone by the new guy. Perhaps the couple coveted and lost attention. 
So they responded by selling a plot of land, quite possibly their greatest asset. So what they may have done is, I've got this land, and he just gave a whole bunch, so I'm going to sell it. And it could we don't know, but it could have been their entire asset, the biggest thing they owned. And they're like, yeah, I don't want to give it all, but I'm going to say I gave it all. I'm going to say that I'm going to do certain things because I want to per be perceived a certain way. Appearance was more important than truth, thus led to deception. Guys, if, if what we want our appearance to be becomes more important than the truth, we've just deceived ourselves, and I guarantee you we've not deceived God. He knows our hearts, and he knows the actual person that we are. You know, you look back into Scripture, and you look back at Genesis, and you see how Adam and Eve, when they walked with God, and then what did they do? They sinned, and they fell back, right? And so the, what did they do from God? They hid. They went and hid from God because they had done something that they knew was wrong. They had lost a holy fear. God said, you have one job, and it's not to eat of that tree. And when Adam did it, he lost that holy fear of God. In Ezekiel chapter 8, I find this very, very uh, uh, shocking statement here. It says, it says this, Ezekiel 8, 12, it says, The Son of Man, have you seen what the leaders of Israel are doing with their idols in dark rooms? They are saying, the Lord does not see us. All of these scenarios have one root in common. A lack of holy fear. We do things, we follow things, we sin because we're not scared of God in a holy fear way. And we talked about the difference of being scared of him and having that holy fear last week. So if you, you weren't here last week, go back and watch that one. Because there's a huge difference between being scared of God and having a holy fear of God. But in our lives, we need to have that. So here's a very important truth. Our holy fear grows uh, proportionally to our comprehension of God's glory. The more that we understand God's word, the more that we dig in and understand this, the more holy fear we have. You know, there's so many things that I haven't done in my life. I look back. And you just start going through your life and you're just like, well, why didn't I do that? Like that, you know, you had this thought of doing something or, or, or whatever. And it's like, well, because I, I didn't want to disappoint God. I didn't want to disappoint my heavenly father is the reason I didn't do this, this, or this. And I guarantee you, all of us in here have either stepped over and said, you know what? I did do that because I didn't have a holy fear or I didn't do that because I have that holy fear. But our holy fear grows proportionally to our knowledge of this. So if we're not digging in this, then we're falling the other direction. You never stay still. Do you understand that? <coughs> you never stay still. You're either, you're either moving and trudging forward, which is uphill. And if you stop trudging and moving forward, you're automatically sliding backwards. There's no standing still. So if you've quit studying the Word of God, you're sliding the other direction. And as you slide the other direction, you're losing this holy fear of God. So if that's true, the opposite is true. We will dumb down God's greatness even to the point of human limitations, the less we fear him. The less we get away from this, the more we put God into a human box. He can't do that. He can't heal cancer. He can't. Why? Because we've lost who God is. God started talking to me about a year ago. Actually, more than a year ago. It was January a year ago. So 
um, started talking to me about how we've, we've, we've related ourselves as Jesus is our friend. Like that's our culture these days, like he's our friend. Oh, God's just your friend. Let me tell you, he's more than your friend. He's the creator of the universe who we should stand in awe of because of who he is. He's the one that created you from nothing. I find funny that the Big Bang Theory actually lines up with the Word of God. Because God said, there it is. They can't explain how nothing or how something came from nothing when we can because there's a creator in the universe that made it happen. There's one that says that he measures the universe in the span of his hand. He knows every hair that's on your head. He knows every one of you by name. And we seem to have just made him our friend. He's just become a friend of Jesus. Is he your friend? Absolutely. But when we, when we take him from being the king and the God and the creator to just a friend, We've put limitations on him. We shouldn't be putting limitations on God. Because God can, you know, I've heard before, well, God doesn't actually audibly speak to anybody anymore. Who says? Are you limiting him? There's somebody sitting in this room that audibly heard from God. Well, God doesn't do this anymore. Are you saying he doesn't do it or did God say he doesn't do it? Because according to scripture in Malachi, somewhere around verse 4 or 5, he says that I am the God that changes not. Why aren't we changing God? We've lost a holy fear of him. The less we fear God, the more emphasis we place on how people see us. I want to be known for this. So let's kind of, let's imagine the journey of Ananias and Sapphira and the journey that led them to their downfall. So the church was young and growing. They were beginning to gain reputation. Come on. And God was perhaps working through them. They enjoyed the feeling of being recognized as important and, re and revealed in it. As their reputation grew, they possibly felt the need to cover their questionable behavior to maintain their reputation. And maybe they fought and disagreed with each other. The couple didn't want their peers to see their disagreements, their strife, so they projected a loving, caring attitude toward others. Possibly, listen, if they had an Instagram, here's what it possibly would say taking a caption, putting the picture up there, you know, taking a little selfie, me and my wife, right? Living the dream. Come on. I love doing life with this person. You know, we tend to project how people, we want people to see us, just like Ananias and Sapphira. We tend to say we want to look a certain direction or a certain way with certain people. We want people to see our vacations and this great food that we just ate. And our husband, oh, I love you so much. My wife, oh, she's my boo. <laughs> we want to see that, but you know what? We don't want people to see the fight we had before we walked in the church this morning yelling at each other in the car trying to quiet the kids down because they just, man, they just spilled something all over them. We had to go home and we had to change. We had to get them a new, oh, come on, y'all. They didn't even have a change of, we get all frustrated and, no, 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 wait, we got to take this one. Calm down. We got to take one picture before we walk into church because we want people to perceive us a certain way. Guys, my life's a mess. And I don't care how you perceive me, good, bad, or ugly. But 
but I do care how God sees me. I keep my heart right. I make sure I do. You know, and in, in, in this is a side note. It's not even in my scriptures. But in, in Psalms 15, verse 3. I think that's right. It's in Psalms 15. I believe it's verse 3. In Psalms 15, verse 3, it says, Keep your word even to your own harm. How many of us don't keep our word because we want to be perceived a different way? Oh, I said I would do that, but I'm really not going to do that. I said I would go, but I'm really not going to. Like, if I, if I try to do that, it's going to cost me too much. And God said, keep your word even to your own harm. Because it doesn't matter how you're perceived here, it's a matter of how you're perceived there. In Paul, or in, in, uh, in Timothy, Paul writes this. The sins of some men are conspicuous, openly evident to all eyes, going before them to the judgment seat and proclaiming their sentence in advance. But get this last part. But the sins of others appear later. Following the offender to the bar of judgment and coming into the view there. See, some people we, we look at and we're like, oh, they got sin in their life. Like, it's evident. Like, you can see it. And then there's those people that are hiding their sin because they have no holy fear of God. And according to this scripture, it's going to be made known. I'd rather make it known here, repent of it, get rid of it, turn around, walk a different direction so that when I get there, it's not there anymore because God's already threw it in the sea of forgetfulness. Then to hide my life, to hide who I, who I am because I want to be perceived a different way. I want to project myself in a certain way because I don't want people to think that I am this way or that way. But I'm going to keep this hidden in my heart. And one day, if you keep it hidden in your heart, according to this scripture, it's either coming out here or it's coming out there. So it's completely up to you. I'm going to close with this statement. God knows not only what I do, but the motives and intentions behind my actions. He knows why you do what you do. Not what you tell others why you did what you did. But he knows you and he knows your heart. Guys, there's this lack of holy fear that we have lost in the big C, little C, whatever C church you want to talk about. There's this lack of fear because we don't stand we can't see God, so sometimes it's hard to say, God, I just, I don't understand. So we continue sinning, we continue doing certain things, we begin uh, projecting certain things and, and wanting to be perceived a certain way because that's more important to me than having a holy fear of God. Having that holy fear of sharing. Why do we not, why, when, God, when God puts on your heart to share the gospel, to walk up to somebody and say, Man, I don't know. God just told me to tell you that he loves you. Why do we not do that? Why do we, and I guarantee you, most everybody in here in this room, including myself, as many as I can raise here, <laughs> have been like, oh, I don't, I can't do that. Why? I don't want to be perceived a certain way. I don't want to be perceived as a Jesus freak. Like that, that, that Christian that just, oh, I don't want to be that guy. Why not? Why don't you want to be that person? Why don't we want to share our faith? And I'm not saying you got to jump up and run up in somebody's face and just, you know, ha, Jesus said. You know, I'm not saying you got to do that. Let's, let's just be real right now. But just, man, if God puts on your heart, just go tell that person they love him. You know, there's a, there was a gentleman that was walking. Uh, he was in, 
uh, a big city like New York. I, I don't, I can't remember which city it was, but he was walking through this city, and 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 when he was walking through the city, uh, uh, everybody that crosses it passes each other right on the street when the little light turns, you know, crossing or whatever, and he crosses and he walks by this guy. And this guy was a missionary. Uh, he was back in the States, and, and he passed a guy. And he was just like, God said, you need to go tell that guy that I, that I love him. So he walks by, and he looks, and he stops, and he walks on. And then he's like, oh, i got to go do it. So he walks back over, and he, he chases this guy down. And he taps him on the shoulder, and he says, hey, uh, so, and I don't know. I just, I just wanted to tell you that, that I had this feeling that God just wanted me to tell you that he loves you. The guy broke down right there and just started crying. And after the guy prayed with him and, and was there with him, he said, he said, I was on my way home to kill myself. What had happened if the guy hadn't had holy fear enough to chase a guy down in the middle of a huge city with people everywhere and say, hey, I just, just needed to tell you something. My image that God sees is what I want care what everybody else thinks. Say what you want to about me. I've had a lot of things said about me over the years. I've had a lot of people throw and project things to me. I don't, that's fine. God fights my battles. I'm not going to stand up here and defend myself. God will defend me. My character will defend me. What, what I feel like God and what I project to God will defend me. The fruit of my labors will defend me. I'm carrying so my question is for you today, are you projecting something that is not you? Do you want to be perceived a certain way? And is it time to stop projecting a certain thing and start looking to God? So if you guys would just stand with me this morning. Look, I don't, I don't know everybody in here. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know the things that you've done or not done. I don't know how you've projected yourself or how you're perceived and if you even care. But there's one thing I do know, and that's a loving God. And that's a God that will accept you into his life right where you're at. That you don't have to change a thing about yourself to come to him. Because the thing that will change is you when you come to him. So I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if you're like, hey, I project a certain image and I, it's not who I am. And I have an actual image in my life that I need to change because that actual image is what God sees in me. So if that's you today, I'm not, we're not going to bow our heads. We're not gonna, you know, the Bible says that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before God. And if you hide yourself from, from me to men, he says, then I'm going to hide myself from you. So if you're in this room today and you're like, hey, I need to change my image because I projected a certain way. And I just need to re-up with God. I need a relationship with God. I need to come back. Whatever it is, I don't care what, what the situation that you're going through. Let me tell you what, what's moving in your heart right now is God. And if you care more about what the people in this room think about you because you're scared to either raise your hand or come up here and say, I need to change my image, it'll get known one day. So if you're in this room today and you're like, I need to change my image, I just want you to raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God's got something for you. God's got something for you. So here's what I want you to do. Roger, if you'll go to the back. Listen, if you raise your hand, just, just step out and go right, right behind the curtain back here. Roger's going to pray with you guys. If you would, just step out and go ahead. Just go. Come on. If you raise your hand, just step out and go. Be bold enough to say, you know what? My life right now may not be the best, and I just want to go stand with God right now. I need to go pray. Roger, just take him right behind the curtain and just pray with him if you would. Guys, this holy fear, I'm telling you, this series, this is, this is only number two. <laughs> we got four more to go. 
We got four more to go, and I hope you're getting this holy fear in yourself. I hope you're understanding that there is a reverence and an awe of God that we need in our life. That it's no longer can just be who I am. I'm just, hey, no, 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 no. It's got to be you. So listen, from a pastor's heart, I love you. And I want to see you win. I want to see you to be a fully engaged follower of Christ. All in, not holding anything back. That's what I want for you.